my name is Silva Lindner. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Information and also the associate director of the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing, which spells ESCAPE. Um, welcome to um, our ESCAPE talk today. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's speaker. I also would like to welcome our remote attendees um, who are joining us uh, via live stream. Um, so um, our speaker today, Sasha Constanza Chok, is a researcher, designer, educator, educator and media maker whose work focuses on network social movement, transformative media organizing, and design, uh, design justice. Uh, they're currently associate professor of civic media at the MIT and faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet Society at Harvard University. So today we'll be hearing about uh, their new book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need. Um, which has just come out uh, with MIT Press. Uh, Sasha is also, um, you know, in addition to her appointment at the MIT and Harvard University to set some context also for, her, for their work, um, a board member of Allied Media Project. Um, Allied Media Project has also helped us organize uh, their visits today um, and a steering committee member of the Design Justice Network. And I just wanted to add that I'm personally um, super excited to have Sasha with us today. I've been a long-term fan of their work and have assigned um, especially uh, their work around uh, design justice that has been you know, circulating in various um, networks through scene production and collective um, design justice work um, in some of my design classes over the last years. So it, indeed, um, it has become, it has been for a long time one of the key tools for me to teach uh, design with a commitment uh, to feminist and decolonizing methods and practices. So I'm extra delighted and honored to have Dr. Constanza Chalk with us today um, and to see um, some of their thinking you know, that has crystallized this long-term work in book form. Um, I should also mention that the talk today will be followed by a rare opportunity of a book signing event with Dr. Constanza Chalk in the conference uh, room C right next door. Uh, so please join us for that as well. And information about book uh, purchase and, and so on and so forth has been circulated um, over email. Books can be purchased um, in the room next door um, and also at Barnes & Noble um, around the corner. So uh, please join me now in welcoming Dr. Constanza uh, Chuck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, I am uh, really happy to be here, um, although, you know, I see that the, uh, there's now a state of emergency has been declared in Michigan. Uh, yesterday, we declared one in Massachusetts. Um, so it's, you know, talks in the time of coronavirus, and we're actually going to get a chance a little bit later on to spend some time on that together. Um, those of you who stay for the workshop, um, I've re remixed the workshop, so rather than do what we were going to do, which was a kind of uh, broad overview of Design Justice 101, um, we're going to spend some time thinking about a university response um, um, to, to COVID-19. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to get into the talk. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, so we're here on the stolen land of the Meskwaki, Fox, Peoria, Anishinaabewaki, and Potawatomi peoples. And we do have a responsibility, those of us who are settlers on this land, to acknowledge the history and continued violence of settler colonialism, and to think about and constantly ask how we can individually, but also institutionally, uh, seek to end that process of violence and find new paths forward. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the new book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need. It's just been published uh, with MIT Press, um, and it started shipping on, on March 3rd. Um, and there are a bunch of copies in the room right over here. Um, and it's also going to be the first book signing that I do, so that's kind of, that's kind of fun. Um, the book is structured around a number of questions that have come out of work um, that I've been doing and the community of practitioners that I'm part of, the Design Justice Network, uh, have been doing for the past several years and is structured in this way. Um, so there's a chapter about values and how do we hard code liberation, about design practices and what does it mean 
to take a page from the disability justice movement and, and do work in ways that, uh, that stay true to the maxim, nothing about us without us. The third chapter is about the power of narratives, uh, the stories that we tell about design and how design processes work and where designed objects and systems come from. Um, there's a chapter about the sites, the privileged sites in which we uh, recognize design work. Um, although design work is happening all the time all around us, uh, some people get paid to do design and some sites get valorized uh, as sites of design uh, work. And, and then the next chapter is about pedagogies and how to, how to teach and learn uh, design justice. And so today what I'm going to do is uh, begin in June of 2017. I'm standing in the security line at Detroit Metro Airport on the way back to Boston from the Allied Media Conference, which is a collaborative laboratory of media-based organizing. It's been held every year in Detroit for the past two decades. At the AMC, over 2,000 people, actually it's getting close to 3,000 people, media makers, designers, activists, and organizers gather every year to share ideas and strategies for how to create a more just, creative, and collaborative world. And as a non-binary, trans, femme presenting person, my time at the AMC is always deeply liberating. It's a conference that strives harder than any I've ever been to, to be deeply inclusive of all kinds of people, including queer, trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming folks. And it's not perfect, and every year brings new challenges and difficult conversations about what it means to construct truly inclusive spaces, but it's a powerful experience. I typically emerge from AMC feeling tired but also refreshed, and my belief in the possibility of building a better world uh, is replenished. But as, I, as I'm standing in the security line at, in, in the Detroit airport, and I'm drawing closer to the millimeter wave scanning machines, my stress levels begin to rise. My heartbeat is speeding up as I near the end of the line because I know that I'm almost certainly, hey Nandi, I'm almost certainly about to be subject to an embarrassing, uncomfortable, and perhaps humiliating search from a TSA officer after my body gets flagged as anomalous by the millimeter wave scanner. And I know that this is almost certainly about to happen because of the particular socio-technical configuration of gender normativity. Cis normativity, or the assumption that all people have a gender identity and presentation that are consistent with the sex they were assigned at birth, and that's been built into the scanner through a combination of the user interface design, the scanning technology, the binary gendered body shape data constructs, and the risk detection algorithms, as well as the socialization, training, and experience of the TSA agents. A female presenting TSA agent motions me to step into the scanner. So you know, you step in, you raise your arms like this, the machine whirs around you, and then the agent signals for you to step forward a little bit out of the machine and wait with your feet on the pad uh, just past the, the machine. And I glance to the left, and that's where a screen is displaying an abstracted outline of a human body. And it looks like this. And as I expected, a bright fluorescent yellow block on the diagram is highlighting my groin area, like that. You see, when I entered the scanner, the TSA operator on the other side was prompted uh, to select a, a blue boy or a pink girl button. This, they actually look like this, right? Um, and they make that decision based on how they read you as you're moving from the other side of the device. Um, raise your hand if you, if you knew that already. This is starting to get to be a little bit wider knowledge, but right. So a couple people knew about the way that this works. So basically, um, since my gender presentation is non-binary femme, usually the operator selects female, but the three-dimensional contours of my body at millimeter resolution differ from the statistical norm of female bodies as understood by the data set and risk algorithm designed by the manufacturer of the millimeter wave scanner and its subcontractors, and as trained by a small army of click workers tasked with labeling and classification, as scholars like Lily Irani, Nick dyer Witherford, and Mary Gray in her new book on ghost work, among others, remind us. If the agent selects male, then my breasts are large enough, statistic statistically speaking, 
in comparison to the normative male body shape construct in the database to trigger an anomaly warning and a highlight around my chest area, like that. If they select female, then my groin area deviates enough from the statistical female norm to trigger the risk alert. And bright yellow pixels highlight my groin, as visible uh, on this side. In other words, I can't win. The socio-technical system is hardwired to mark me as risky, and that will trigger an escalation to the next level in the security protocol. And that, in fact, is what happens in June of 2017. I'm flagged, so the agent then asks me to step aside, asks for my consent to a physical body search, uh, and typically at that point, once I'm close enough to the agent, they're getting confused about my gender and about my sex, and that presents a problem because the next step in the security protocol is for either a male or female TSA agent to conduct a body search by running their hands across your arms and your legs, uh, the anomalous area, your chest, your hips, your inner thighs, and according to TSA policy, quote, if a pat-down is performed, and I don't like the term pat-down, it sounds so cute, um, if a pat-down is performed, it will be conducted by an officer of the same gender as you present yourself. As a non-binary trans femme, I present a problem that's not easily resolved by the uh, algorithm of the security protocol. So sometimes the agent assumes that I'd prefer to be searched by a female agent, sometimes male, sometimes they ask what I would prefer. Unfortunately, uh, neither is an honest but not an acceptable response. So today, I'm particularly unlucky. A nearby male presenting agent observes the interaction and loudly states, I'll do it, and strides over to me. And I say, aren't you gonna ask me what I prefer? And he pauses, he begins to move toward me again. The other agent stops him and asks me what I would prefer. But now, I'm standing in public. I've got two TSA agents on each side of me. There's a line of curious travelers watching the whole interaction. And ultimately, one of them searches me, uh, makes a face as if they're uncomfortable as I am, and I'm cleared to continue on to my gate. The point of this story is to provide a small but concrete example from my own daily lived experience of how larger systems, including norms, values, and assumptions, are encoded in and reproduced through the design of socio-technical systems, or in political theorist Langdon Winner's famous words, how artifacts have politics. In this case, cis normativity is enforced at multiple levels of my interaction with airport security systems. At each stage, airport security technology, databases, algorithms, risk assessment, scanners, practices, it's all designed based on the assumption that there are only two genders, two biological sexes, that gender presentation conforms with so-called biological sex, and anyone whose body doesn't fall within an acceptable range of deviance from a bimodal, well actually a normative binary body type is flagged as risky, and subject to a heightened and disproportionate burden of the harms whether small or potentially large, of airport security systems and the violence of empire they instantiate. Queer, trans, intersex, and gender nonconforming people are thus disproportionately burdened by the design of millimeter wave scanning technology and the way that technology is used. The system is biased against us. To use Os Key's term, it's a misgendering machine. Most cisgender people are unaware of the fact that the millimeter wave scanners operate according to a binary and cis-normative gender construct. And most trans people know because it directly affects our lives. Of course, these systems don't, they're not only biased against trans people, they're biased against black people who frequently experience invasive searches of their hair, as recently documented by ProPublica, and against Sikh men, Muslim women, and others who wear head wraps, as described by sociologist Simone Brown in her brilliant book, Dark Matters. As Brown discusses, and as Joy Bolamwini, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, technically demonstrated, gender itself is racialized. Humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. Airport security is also systematically biased against many people with disabilities who are likely to be flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or use prostheses. Those who are simultaneously queer and trans, black, indigenous, people of color, Muslim, immigrant, people with disabilities are doubly, triply, or multiply burdened by 
and face the highest risk of harms from this system. So my white skin, US citizenship, and institutional affiliation with MIT place me in a position of relative privilege. I'll certainly be spared the most disruptive and harmful possible outcomes of security screening. For example, I don't have to worry that this process is going to lead to my being placed in a detention center or in deportation proceedings. I'm not going to be hooded and whisked away to Guantanamo Bay or to one of the many other secret prisons that form part of the global infrastructure of the so-called war on terror. Most likely, I won't even miss my flight. I'll just be slightly detained for what security expert Bruce Schneier describes as security theater. Others face much greater potential harms. And here I want us to take a moment to think about Joana Medina Leon and Roxana Hernandez. Joana Medina Leon died uh, on June 21st of 2018, the first day of Pride Month. She was a 25-year-old trans woman from El Salvador who was detained, uh, a euphemism for incarcerated, by ICE for over a month at Otero County Processing Center in New Mexico. It's a site run by a private company called Management and Training Corporation. I mean, they should have just called it Evil Corps. Um, according to a recent report by ACLU of New Mexico, the Santa Fe Dreamers Project, and the Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center, at this site, LGBTQ migrants systematically suffer, quote, inadequate medical care, retaliation and unlawful use of solitary confinement, and rampant sexual harassment, discrimination, and abuse. Joanna died just over a year after Roxana, a 33-year-old trans woman from Honduras, died in ICE custody of dehydration and complications from HIV after she was beaten and denied medical care, according to an independent autopsy commissioned by her family and the Transgender Law Center. And I want to note here, um, I just saw um, yesterday, Aura Bogado has a very powerful um, Twitter thread about the conditions in migrant uh, jails, migrant detention facilities, and what that is going to mean in the current uh, co you know, COVID-19 um, outbreak, um, the, the conditions, the lack of access to care, the lack of access to hydration, um, the extreme overcrowding. Um, there's already um, deaths happening on a regular basis um, in these facilities, and this is, this is going to be um, much, much worse for people in that situation. Of course, the violent erasure of trans and gender nonconforming people isn't a new thing. It's been happening for hundreds of years under the ongoing project of settler colonialism. Cis normativity was imposed upon indigenous peoples throughout the Americas and around the world through hundreds of years of violence, both spectacular and everyday. Two-spirit scholars and activists like Harden, Pr Harlan Pruden are systematically recovering these histories. So by grounding an analysis of cis-normative border security systems in hundreds of years of settler colonial violence, I want to make it very clear that I'm not an advocate of a, quote, technical solution to the problems with millimeter wave scanners. I'm not asking for them to be less biased or more fair and transparent. Simple inclusion or fixing the anomaly doesn't get at the underlying historical and structural problems. Um, Instead, I'm asking us to think as designers, artists, technologists, researchers, community organizers, and as empathic human beings about how we build a world where millimeter wave scanners don't exist, where they, like other border technologies and carceral systems and the violence of empire, have been abolished. So like Harsha Walia, I'm interested in undoing border imperialism. And I'm interested in dismantling what Ruha Benjamin calls the new Jim Code, discriminatory design that amplifies racial hierarchies through engineered inequity, through default discrimination, coded exposure, and what she calls techno-benevolence. Ruha is calling out how tech design so often ignores and thereby replicates social divisions, or aims to, quote, fix racial bias, but ultimately reproduces it. So I'm interested in decarceral design, and in decolonizing design, and in design justice.
So my work is about the relationship between socio-technical systems, design, and power. It's about design and social justice. It's about a growing community of designers, developers, artists, technologists, researchers, organizers, and many others who are interested in the theory and practice of design justice. And I think of it, on the one hand, as a framework for analysis of how the design of socio-technical systems can influence the distribution of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. So how does design distribute benefits and burdens? And specifically, how does design reproduce and or challenge what Patricia Hill Collins calls the matrix of domination? White supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler colonialism, and other forms of structural and historical inequality. Black feminist thought fundamentally reconceptualizes race, class, and gender as interlocking systems. They, they don't only operate on their own, but are often experienced together by individuals, all of us, who exist at their intersections. And the analytical framework built on that fundamental insight is called intersectionality. The idea has a longer legacy. You could think of African-American abolitionist and women's rights activist Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman, Communist Party Secretary Claudia Jones's writings about being triply oppressed, or the Combahee River Collective's critiques of white feminism. But the specific term was first published by black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in her 1989 article, Demarginalizing the Intersections of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics. And in that article, Crenshaw describes how existing anti-discrimination law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, repeatedly failed to protect black women workers. And if you haven't read that original article, I mean, you know, this is a term that's used increasingly widely now, and that's good, and that's important. But especially if you're working on computing, um, I really encourage you to read that initial article because in the article what she's doing is she's looking at the data sets that people are trying to bring to court to prove discrimination uh, against black women and the ways that the courts refuse to admit um, data. So when, um, when a company uh, is, you know, has uh, black men that they've hired, uh, then the courts say, well, there's no evidence that black women are being discriminated against because there's lots of black men that they've hired. Uh, and basically the courts systematically decide not to allow these claims um, by either saying you don't, have, uh, you don't have enough data or you can't stand in for all black people as black women. Um, you can't represent the interests of the class. And the data, we don't have enough data to prove discrimination. Um, so that article is also about data science and you should check it out. Um, so design justice asks us to consider how universalist design principles and practices erase certain groups of people, specifically those who are intersectionally disadvantaged or multiply burdened under white supremacist heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and settler colonialism. So when designers do consider inequality in either perceptibility or availability of design affordances um, or the distribution of design's benefits and burdens, we nearly always employ a single axis framework. So most design processes uh, are therefore structured in ways that make it impossible to see, engage with, account for, or try to remedy the unequal distribution of benefits and burdens that they reproduce. The single axis analysis says, oh, let's see if, um, you know, if this uh, chair is going to be more accessible to men or women, and that's it, and that's all that you look at. Or uh, let's see if this particular interface um, is easier to use for one type of structurally disadvantaged person over another without looking at the intersections. Um, but as Crenshaw notes, feminist theory and anti-racist policy that's not grounded in an intersectional understanding of gender and race can never adequately address the experiences of black women when it comes to the formulation of policy demands. And design justice holds that the same is true when it comes to design demands. Without an intersectional analysis, we can't design objects or systems or a built environment or interfaces or anything really that adequately address the experiences of people who are multiply burdened within the matrix of domination. Okay. 
closely linked to intersectionality, but less widely used, the matrix of domination is a term developed by black feminist scholar, sociologist, and past president of the American Sociological Association, Patricia Hill Collins, to refer to race, class, and gender as interlocking systems of oppression. It's a conceptual model that helps us think about how power, oppression, resistance, privilege, penalties, benefits, harms are systematically distributed. And when she introduces the term in her book, Black Feminist Thought, Collins emphasizes race, class, and gender as the three systems that historically have been most important in structuring most black women's lives. She notes that additional systems of oppression structure the matrix of domination for other kinds of people. And the term for her describes a mode of analysis that includes any and all systems of oppression that mutually constitute each other and shape our lives. The framework also emphasizes that every individual simultaneously receives both benefits and harms, or penalty and privilege, as she puts it, based on our location within the interlocking systems of oppression that structure our experience. So we're simultaneously members of multiple dominant groups and multiple subordinate groups. And design justice urges us to consider how design affordances and disaffordances, objects and environments, services, systems, and processes simultaneously distribute both penalty and privilege to individuals based on our location within the matrix of domination, and to attend to the way that this operates at various scales, personal, community, and institutional. So I don't have time to give examples of everything, but I do have the book that you can pick up and check out. Um, but design justice urges us to explore how technology design relates to domination and resistance at these three levels, personal, community, and institutional. So for example, at the personal level, interface design might affirm or deny a person's identity through features like a binary gender dropdown during a profile creation, right? Um, so such a seemingly small design decision ultimately plays out in disparate impacts that they have on different individuals' biographies or life chances. At the community level, platform design fosters certain kinds of communities while suppressing others through setting and implementing community guidelines, rules, and speech norms, instantiated through different kinds of content moderation systems. At the institutional level, design justice asks us to consider the role of the various institutions that control and shape design processes, such as companies like Google, Apple, or Microsoft, venture capitalists, nation states that decide what kinds of design to prioritize through research funding, like will it be military technologies? Will it be artificial intelligence? Will it be vaccines for a new virus? Um, standard settings bodies, such as ISO, W3C, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or laws, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act. We could also think about institutions such as universities that educate designers, uh, and so on. And additionally, institutions design objects, systems, and processes that they then use to distribute benefits and harms across society. For example, the ability to immigrate to the United States is unequally distributed between different groups of people through a combination of laws passed by the US Congress, software decision support systems, executive orders that influence enforcement priorities, and so on. And within the broader immigration system, visa allocation is an algorithm designed according to the ideology and priorities of those who hold political power. Uh, just recently, the Department of Homeland Security announced that they're gathering social media and email data on all visa applicants, uh, as you can see in the dropdown here. Um, so this, do you have a social media presence? Select from the list below each social media platform you have used within the last five years. And then in the space next to the platform's name, enter the username or handle. Um, so here you get to fill out your Ask FM profile, your Facebook, your Flickr, your MySpace, um, <laughs> your Vine, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and DHS put out a bid, an open bidding process, this was last year, um, for a company to design a good, a good immigrant, bad immigrant prediction system. Um, and this was going to be one of the inputs uh, into the system that they were going to train. And after uh, they explored a number of the bids, they determined that 
Uh, it would be too difficult to do at the moment. They canceled the bid, uh, yay, but then they reallocated the money to hire a giant team. I'm not sure how many people they ended up hi hiring. Um, somewhere around, I don't know, I forget if it was 800 or 1800, somewhere in that order of magnitude of people uh, to manually go through uh, the visa applications and review all the material and filter people into a good immigrant, bad immigrant uh, list. Um, while they're figuring out uh, whether it can be automated later. Uh, finally, black feminist thought also emphasizes the value of situated knowledge over universalist knowledge. And in particular, insights about the nature of power, oppression, and resistance come from those who occupy subjugated standpoints. Um, now we could spend a lot more time on this, but um, I, think, I think we need to, to move on. I will, I will just note one, one of the things that I um, hope to have more conversations with people about as the book starts to circulate more is the concept of disaffordances and disaffordances. Um, so the idea that uh, when we're doing interface design, every time that we make somebody, um, uh, so not allowing someone to select an identity that they might have is a disaffordance um, and with an I, disaffordance, and forcing someone to select an identity that they don't hold in order to continue uh, is a disaffordance, D-Y-S. Um, and so I'm building on an, some other scholarship about that, but I think that that's, an, that's something that I want to talk more about, maybe in the Q&A. Of course, design justice isn't a term I created. Uh, it's something that comes out of a community of practice. And there wouldn't be any design justice theory or practice without the design justice network and the Design Justice Network organizers, especially Yuna Lee, Victoria Barnett, Wes Taylor, Carlos Garcia, Nancy Kalila Mutiti, Danielle Albert, Victor Moore, Ebony Dumas, and many, many others. And this is a community of design practitioners who participate in and work with social movements and community-based organizations, mostly across the United States, but also around the world. It includes designers and developers, technologists and journalists, community organizers and activists, researchers, and many others. And there are overlapping communities of practice that are doing this work. Um, we, were, we were just talking before the, the talk began about how there's been an explosion just in the last few years uh, of work that's critical of the design theory canon. Um, there's a new book that actually just launched last night by uh, Catherine Ignacio and Lauren Klein, which is uh, Data Feminism, um, which I encourage you to check out. That's also open access available. Um, there's the Decolonizing Design Group. There's um, Afrofuturist speculative design like Alondra Nelson's work um, and so many others. There's Arturo Escobar's work on designs for the Pluriverse, which is coming out of um, the desire to uh, think about decentering uh, what he calls the one world ontology um, that has erased indigenous life worlds and ways of knowing and ways of making knowledge. Um, so there's, there's so much work happening right now. Um, and a lot of it is in dialogue and some of it is in parallel. And uh, here I'm just gonna focus on the Design Justice Network because that's the, the community that I'm closest to. The Design Justice Network was born at the Allied Media Conference in the summer of 2016, when a group of 30 designers, artists, techies, and community organizers took part in a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. And the goal of that workshop was to move beyond the frames of, quote, social impact design or design for good, to challenge designers to think about how good intentions are not necessarily enough to ensure that design processes and practices become tools for liberation, and to also develop principles that might help practitioners avoid the often unwitting reproduction of existing inequalities. It was um, a group of people who were interested in uh, thinking about these questions, so thinking about when you have any given design process, you know, who's, who's involved in that process? Who's running that process? Who's paying for it? Who was harmed through this process? And who benefited? 
and how was that distributed? And so um, that first year there were a number of um, Detroit-based design projects and the literature about them and we sort of looked at them together in small breakout groups and analyzed them uh, through this lens and then used that conversation to start generating what would later become the design justice principles. We're, we're always interested in the distribution of benefits, so how does designing something assi assign benefits, and typically that's more of them go to the more powerful people in the process, and fewer go to those who are less powerful. And similarly, harms. Often most of the harms end up falling on those who are multiply burdened within the matrix of domination. And so over time, we developed a set of principles, we reworked them, um, and then we launched them um, uh, about a year and a half ago. And since then, people have been signing on to them. There are now around eight or 900 signatories. I'm not sure what the latest count is. Um, and people are becoming members of the Design Justice Network. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the activities of the network in a moment. But first, I just want to uh, share the principles as they've uh, been developed by this network over time. And actually, as I, as I show them, maybe uh, if you, you could just, if you like any of them or if they kind of inspire you, you could read them uh, together with me. So, principle one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Does anyone want to read number two? Number two. Thank you. So I want to read number three. We prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Number four. In view change that an emerging from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process rather than as a point at the end of the process. Thank you. Number five. There's only 10 of them. We're almost halfway there. Ed? <laughs> uh, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. We believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. Thanks, Emma. Um, we work towards sustainable, community-led, and controlled outcomes. <coughs> we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. And let's all read the last one together. Before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional, indigenous, and local knowledge and practices. Thank you, it's like church. <laughs> <laughs> so you can sign on to these principles at designjustice.org, um, and many people are. And people, um, I also wanted, wanted to highlight that these principles and this whole community, they, there are many antecedents, right? And so the first uh, Design Justice Network gathering came out of a group of folks who were involved in um, organizing discotheques inside the Allied Media Conference. And a discotheque is a community technology uh, fair that comes out of the work of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. Um, and so there's this whole sort of lineage of events and processes and approaches uh, that have inspired each other, sort of circulating around the Allied Media Network. Um, we could also talk about the ways that these principles have then gone on to directly influence other types of uh, design jams and event spaces like the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Hackathon and Policy Summit um, that was organized for a couple years um, by uh, Catherine Dignacio and Alexis Hope and uh, many others um, to rethink initially breast pumps as a device, but then uh, more broadly, what are all of the barriers um, to, um, to people being able to breastfeed and that includes policy, like the lack of family leave, and it includes the built environment, like the lack of 
um, spaces, um, you know, within institutional settings or you know, room lactation rooms, um, and it includes, um, you know, so many other factors. So that this this event evolved from a hackathon type uh, space into something that also was broader, was looking at policy implications, was bringing in um, reproductive justice organizations um, led uh, by women of color um, who often are end up because of intersecting oppressions, especially in, in this country, um, end up least able um, to breastfeed for uh, a, a long period of time, and so on and so forth. So the design justice principles directly informed the creation of this, uh, this event and this process. Um, you can learn more about that um, on that project site. Um, the network has produced a series of zines that are used pretty widely as teaching tools both in the academy and also increasingly um, in design shops and spaces where people are, are building new technologies um, and uh, in architecture shops um, where people are working on the built environment uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the Building Consentful Tech zine has come out of this and beyond the zine, a broader project um, led by Yuna Lee and others around uh, how we should rethink technology design processes so that they follow the Fry's model of consent. So consent, rather than just being a click-through, should be freely given, revocable, informed, uh, enthusiastic, and specific. Um, and that's the model that comes from Plan Planned Parenthood's version of what does consent really look like, consent culture in, um, in sex, well, what would that look like in tech? Um, and there's now some of the first consentful technology prototype uh, processes are happening um, with, um, and, and some, some more is gonna come out about that this summer. Um, this is an approach that also uh, is informing researchers. So I worked on this project uh, called the More Than Code uh, project where we interviewed um, technology practitioners uh, around what it would look like to build a new field of public interest technology. Um, and that was something that a lot of funders have been talking about recently, but we wanted to talk to people who thought of themselves as uh, public interest practitioners in the technology space, community technologists and social justice technologists um, to learn about what's most needed in the field. And we synthesized that into um, a series of, of key takeaways that you can read more about at morethancode.cc. And I think that it's also worth sort of talking about um, this work in the context of the cultural moment that we're in um, that some people are calling the tech clash. Um, so this is people working inside Silicon Valley firms on the one hand starting to rise up and resist and talk about the ways that they don't want to build tools uh, that are going to reproduce oppression explicitly. So you have Google workers who successfully fought uh, to keep uh, Google from getting Project Maven, which was a demo design contract with the DOD um, to, for the new cloud computing system that the Pentagon is, is, uh, is building. Um, you have um, the Google walkouts for real change where you had thousands of Googlers from all around the world um, protesting the culture of um, sexual harassment and impunity uh, you know, inside the company. Um, you have uh, Googlers fighting against um, their company doing custom contracts with Border Patrol, um, no GCP for CBP, so saying we don't want to sell cloud services where they're going to be used to systematically round up and detain and deport people. And so this is, it's not only Google, this is happening all across um, the, the tech sector. Um, and I think that that's an interesting moment that we're living in that needs to be supported. And it's uh, tech won't build it is a hashtag that's pretty widely used if you want to learn more about that type of work. Um, and so that's a piece of what's happening. I'm also trying to learn you know, how, to, how to teach this approach. And I do that at MIT through the Collaborative Design Studio that I've been teaching there since 2012, where students partner with community-based organizations and learn how to build something together that's going to respond to real-world community needs. Um, and 
I think I want to, to end it there uh, so that we have time to really have a pretty robust conversation. So um, I guess I'll say, I'll just wrap it up by saying that design justice is this way of thinking about things and it's also this growing community of people. And I hope that as we continue to sort of push back on and critique the way that uh, technologies are traditionally built uh, and designed, um, that we continue to do that and then we also uh, continue to elaborate other possible modes of working together um, so that we can reorient our time and our energy and our efforts towards uh, building a world that's more free and that is less deeply structured uh, by that matrix of domination um, and that that's going to take, take all of us to do that. So, thank you. Um, I think I think what I want to why am I using this? I'm already mic'd. Um, I think what I want to do is um, this model where instead of just jumping right into the back and forth, I'd like people to just turn to your neighbor now um, and take a couple minutes to talk about a que question that you might be thinking of asking. And I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, and then we'll bring it back to the full group and have a conversation. If you're not sitting next to someone, just turn around in your chair.
use on this thing, even though I've already messed. But bring, uh, bring it back, please. Can you help? Because uh, we need that for the. Is this part being live streamed too? Yeah. Yeah, we're continuing. Okay. So we need to use the mic for the um, for the stream. And I will help. Um, yeah. So who has a comment or a question? Um, I have a question about how do you work with existing infrastructure and systems that already exist, and how do you incorporate design justice into like things that already exist? Like when you're building, like working on a new idea, or, like coming up with new technology or infrastructure. Like given the knowledge we have right now, it is relatively easier to incorporate these things. But how do you do it with um, existing technology, existing infrastructure, existing teams, and all of that? Um, do you have like a specific you know context that you're working in, or? Well, um, so I mean, like if we think of the, the um, airport body scanning machines, right? Like, what would it take to incorporate design justice into those existing machines, which exist all over the world? Then? Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, as I as I talked about in the talk, you know, some one of the things that design justice makes us do is think about when. Do we need it's when do we need to redesign or rebuild or make a particular uh, tool to be more inclusive and when does its very existence reproduce that matrix of domination that we're trying to dismantle? So in the case of the airport security scanners, you know I'm not interested in making a gender neutral airport security scanner. I think that they're a security feeder. I think that they primarily serve um, for power of an unjust kind to reproduce itself. Um, and I think that you know, we, should, we should eliminate them. Um, but um, the, in the broader question, you know, to me, it's kind of about you know, what, what communities are you part of or are you in relationship with, that you can work with, people who may not necessarily think of themselves as technologists or designers, but have uh, real both real needs and real strengths. And so you can think about using like asset-based approaches to design and say, well, here's a community that I'm from or that I support or am in relationship with. And I want to think about how do I use my skills as a, um, you know, an interaction designer or whatever the case may be um, to amplify and build upon and support um, some already existing um, you know, community work. Maybe, and so that it's about Rather than saying, here's this community I'm going to design for or solve their problem for, I'm going to step in and do a thing. It's about how do we work together and I bring my skills to the table while recognizing that there's a lot of lived experience and understanding um, that's going to help you build something together um, that will be really useful. Is that getting it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a, a question. Uh, this is something I've been encountering in my own work is when I've been doing um, design with trans communities. Often there will be ideas that come up that are not technologically feasible. So things that people would like to see in the world but we can't actually build. And I'm curious your thoughts on what do we do when things that the community wants and needs are not things that we can actually build. Um, now I want to know about these magical trans technologies that we want to tell, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just give one example um, of a body changing laboratory. So you step into a booth, you select you know, which options you want, and then magically you're able to have you know, all of the surgeries and things like that that you may desire mm. um, without actually having to go through those medical procedures. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Okay, so that's, that's a good question. I feel like there's a lot of answers, right? Um, and you know, one, one way to think about this is the way that um, you know, cur currently, um, depending on the amount of access and power and resources that you have and that you control, which is largely going to be structured by your position within the matrix of domination, you kind of can have that or something very much like it already. Um, so, um, you know, if you have a lot of money, um, then um, all of your desires around 
body shaping and transition and so on and so forth are a lot going to be a lot more accessible. Um, so one kind of answer to that is that you know what's possible or not possible, although it may not be a booth that you step into and press a button, it's like you get much more easy access um, you know, based on the amount of power and privilege that you have and money and so on. Um, another way to think about it is that you know, I'm a big fan of speculative design. Um, I have a, a whole workshop that I've developed together with Joana Varon from Coding Rights, which is a feminist hacker organization in Brazil, which is the oracle for trans-feminist speculative technology, um, which is a mm -hmm. card deck that you can use to imagine um, far future um, technologies that are informed by trans-feminist uh, theory, and um, which is beautifully illustrated also. Actually, I, let me pull it up. Um, so I encourage people to um, to do that type of imagining processes all the time um, because I think that creating those stories and creating that vision, you know, uh, that's an important entry point or beginning part of a process of actually building uh, technologies that exist in the real world. Um, and so the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies uh, looks like this and um, you get delta hand of different types of technologies that you then have to remix through um, trans-feminist values um, like autonomy, pleasure, sustainability, decoloniality. Um, and you can use them to survive, survive different kinds of situations. Um, so I really like that type of activity. Um, and I think that often, um, as people make these blueprints for trans-feminist technologies, um, then you move to the next step, which is prototyping. And, you know, well, what could we build with today's technologies? Um, and what is something that's a near future possibility? And what is something that's, um, you know, so far future that it's going to be like magic? But without um, creating those, those visions and those ideas, you know, we'll never, we'll never build um, these liberatory technologies in the future. Oh wait, use the mic for the stream. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Suppose Bernie Sanders is our next president, hires you to redesign TSA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, would, would you seriously just eliminate it and say, yeah, no more airport security, whoever? Yes, but the important part would be the process that we would use to get there. So um, I would start by, you know, convening a um, really well-resourced process that would draw in um, people from many different kinds of communities. So people who are new migrants, um, organizations that represent, you know, immigrants and their needs, people from communities that are sort of receiving communities where. They're starting to receive migration and people are concerned about it. And we would generate this whole sort of dialogue and process uh, for the whole country to come to grips um, with what is, what is migration about? Why do people migrate? What's needed um, to best support people um, to arrive and have access to the things that they need so that they can uh, you know, become uh, productive parts of the of the body politic and culture and so on and so forth, um, and so we'd have really good resources to do a lot of public education around what is migration about and what is border control about really, um, and then in my dream universe we would then <laughs> arrive at a realization that for most of human history we haven't had such things and we don't really need them and that we'll all be better off without them. But that's not something you can just tell people. Uh, it's something that you have to figure out what is the process that's going to get you there. I will take this as an opportunity to ask a question. Um, so I've been thinking about this for a while um, with regards to my work in, in China and other parts of Asia. Um, there is no 
commonly used term right now in Chinese for design justice. It hasn't become like an academic movement of the same kind as here. Um, and so I would love to hear your take on what you see as the challenges of thinking through the place that something like design justice might have in a, in a context, um, you know, you could say in a transnational context, but also in a post-colonial context, you know, where design has historically operated in China, for instance, you know, but also in other parts of the global south, um, as something that is understood as originating from the West, as something that isn't necessarily um, what people think of when, it, when they hear China, you know, so historically people, when they hear China, they think maybe copycat production or mass manufacturing. And even though that has been challenged, you know, there's still this sort of notion, even within China, that design is something that comes from the West. So, so I would love to hear sort of your take on what might be the challenges, even the design justice is perhaps facing in this, in this sort of, you know, in this, in this context of enduring colonialism in design, in engineering, you know, where there's still a sense that other regions don't design as well as quote unquote we do, right? So is, is there a particular place for design justice in that context, and is there maybe also a challenge in terms of how do we then look back at also what, what is design justice then as a movement in terms of its origin story or its legacy? Yeah. Well, you're the one who's written a book about the comparison, so I need to know more about what you think about what that process is going to look like because I don't I know very little about uh, you know Chinese design history and so on. Like I'm familiar with the broader. I guess, cultural narrative of like copycat production, which is then slowly transitioning into um, more innovative forms of technology design. But then there must be so much also, you know, deep history of maybe it's not, maybe the term isn't design, but there are many ways of thinking about what it means to, uh, to shape objects in the environment. And um, so I guess one, one part of my answer would be about, yes, absolutely, we need to challenge design canon and uh, decolonize design. And there's a whole, you know, there's a, there's a decolonized design group um, that is working on uh, decolonizingdesign.com. So um, this is a transnational collective that's been uh, gathering and developing and producing uh, papers and critiques and knowledge and trying to think about how do we do that work of unsettling the canon um, what what does it mean to draw in design histories from many different locations and places and times around the world? So I think that that's you know, one, one piece of the work. Um, I also think that um, in terms of translation and the way that design justice principles and ideas and concepts are moving, so just recently actually um, um, Wes and Victoria, two of the other um, members of the Design Justice Network Steering Committee were invited to go uh, to Italy to meet with a group of people there who've started up a local node of the Design Justice Network that is a, um, it's people from all around the Mediterranean region and they're trying to create a, um, they're trying to localize design justice um, for the, me the Mediterranean context. And so that there are a lot of like challenges around fortress Europe and border militarization between North Africa and Southern Europe. There's a whole sort of conversation about migration there and uh, um, the, the crossings there that are oversea um, and the really high number of people that are constantly dying, um, you know, making that crossing. There's also sort of the cultural power of Southern Europe as a design center historically so that, you know, like Italy's weight in design spaces or, you know, or Barcelona um, in architecture and so on. And so they're trying to rethink all of that and consider what would it mean to localize design justice. And part of that has involved literal translation. So they created a zine um, where they translated um, the design justice principles and some of the key theories that design justice is built on. Um, they summarized a number of texts and translated them into um, uh, Spanish and Catalan, um, because of course there's also there's the Catalan, you know, independence and uh, brutal crackdown from the Spanish central government happening right now. So I think that depending where you go, like it's going to be so context specific, like what's going to need to happen. 
um, for this work to move effectively. And in some places, maybe just translating design justice isn't what's needed, but maybe design justice becomes a seed or an inspiration for locally organizing um, you know, designers and those they're working with um, to think about what it means um, it, you know, in, 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 in a local context. So that we're, we have had these conversations about, oh, will design justice become a colonizing force as it sort of spreads around the world? And so we do take that seriously and we're interested in supporting people to rethink how design processes work, um, but if the lenses need to shift and if there are other theories that are more relevant um, and other, not just theories, but social movement histories, um, that of course we, you know, we support that rather than just saying we found the one true model. And we think of the principles as being something, it's a living text, um, which will be you know, regularly revised. And so the version that we read here together today um, is the, the current version that's emerged over the last couple of years of work. Um, but we certainly imagine that it will shift. And I hope that, um, that we'll learn a lot from Chinese designers reimagining um, the canon and, the, and, and, and those processes and, and, and so on and so forth as it evolves. Um, oh, I also would say um, that Lily Irani's work, um, I think, is really important in, in this conversation. Uh, so, you know, Lily has written this book about, like, neoliberal entrepreneurial subjectivity in India and the emergence of, like, design and innovation and the way that that does work for the nation state as it tries to... Uh, you know, organize people's time and energy and organize capital. Um, and she also sort of critiques the emergence of design thinking as a concept, um, in part because she's saying, look, what's going on here is that as, as each stage in the um, design and prototyping and production and distribution uh, of objects um, gets shifted out of the US, uh, and Western Europe, um, and as people move up the, the sort of the value chain, right, you have this whole backlash where mostly Western designers said, oh, well, you know, it's no longer just copycat production, now there's design and prototyping happening locally, so we've got to come up with something new that will enable us to continue charging these insane hourly rates for all of our clients. So design thinking and strategy, the design of you know, innovation strategy uh, now becomes something that's seen as a higher order uh, type of design that can only still only be accomplished by mostly uh, white cis male designers in the West. And so she's, this is Lily, my attempt to summarize Lily Arani's argument around how this all works. Um, I hope I didn't butcher it, but I highly recommend reading her stuff. Thanks for your, your talk in your book. Um, I'm sorry, I've been following each other on Twitter for like a decade, but um, nice to meet you. Hi. Um, <laughs> so I've been thinking about, along with Oliver here and, and Lisa and Nakamura, about um, justice versus fairness and more thinking in the context of online environments and how to treat people. Um, and kind of pushing back an idea of fairness, which computer scientists and fat star and whatever it seems of really like because you can formalize it in justice. You can't really formalize in systems, but then we, like this, are also saying that we're going to figure out how to design systems that are just. And it, I, I guess I've just been wrestling with the idea. It seems like it's not really aligned with actually being able to build or design systems, and yet that's also what we want to try to do. Have you thought about this or fairness? And yeah, um, great to meet you. Um, I am also critical of fairness as a framing. Um, you know, I think that it's important and interesting that a whole community, uh, you know, that Fat Star has emerged around, you know, how do we, how do we formalize this? Um, how do we talk about um, different, different formal models of what fairness means and then how, would we, how do we implement that in, you know, automated decision-making support systems and so on and so forth. So it's not that, like, I'm critical of it, but I think it's important that it's happening. And I think that it's, um, 
we, we do need to develop those types of tools. I, so to me, it's more just that fairness is not enough. Uh, I'm not anti-fairness. <laughs> um, but I think that depending on how you conceive it and frame it, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get us where I believe we need to be. It doesn't get us where movements for liberation want us to be. Um, I have been trying to spend some time recently thinking about like teaching examples that we could use to explore that, uh, that concept. And one of, them, um, one of them is around university admissions um, decision support algorithms. So you could say, OK, um, we're trying to make, let's say that the University of Michigan is trying to make, the, um, uh, make admissions fair, right? And you say, well, let's just say that we want that to, to mean that the incoming freshman class you know, looks more or less like the demographics of Michigan or the United States. Or pick, you, know, pick, you have to pick a geographic bound. Uh, but let's just say it's Michigan. Um, so then you would like figure out how do we set up an update to your Adobe Flash Player? How would you set up um, you know, a recommendation system that would produce recommended candidates uh, that would allow your incoming class to have like you know, gender parity and race ethnicity parity, you know, rough parity uh, with the population of Michigan? So that would be sort of one approach. But then you could say, well, okay, but really what we're looking for is an entire you know, undergraduate student body that looks more like parity with the population. And so then you say, well, now we've got to look at the, now we expand the data set a little bit and we say it's the entire enrolled undergraduate student body and that means that the admissions decisions for next year, depending on how long we want the transition to take, um, it's gonna look a little bit different because instead of admitting 51% women, for example, um, now we're gonna have to uh, admit a higher percentage than that because we already have an, in, we have an imbalance in the upperclassmen, right? And then you could zoom out a little bit further and say, well, but what if the data set that we're using is the institutional lifetime uh, you know, student data set? And then that's going to start to look very, very different. And maybe that's going to mean that your next year is going to primarily be a class of, I don't know, black trans women or something. I, I don't know what it is, but um, what I'm saying is that just by setting the time bounds, the geographic bounds, um, even if you're using a very... Um, widely conventional conception of fairness, um, you can actually get to things that look like um, making shifts in long-standing historical and structural uh, inequality. Um, and that's why I don't think that the fat star stuff is useless. I think that we need it. I think that we need to develop those models. But then there's this whole conversation and decision-making process that's happening um, outside of which is how are you how are you telling the story of what it is that you're trying to do? How are you scoping the problem? Um, and sco design scoping is something that falls within pretty standard conversations about design and what it is and how it works. And so I think that there's a lot of leeway um, to insert justice-led analyses um, into other stages of the technology design process that aren't just like, well, but how is the algorithm sorting things? Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'd love to hear other people's examples. Like, I actually, I feel like we need to build a whole like library of teaching examples about like fairness and justice and the difference and in ways that can be heard by many more people. So this question comes from a graduate student who is watching the live stream. Oh, cool. Um, in the age of social media. What do you think is the value of zines regarding design, justice, and fostering dialogue within the community? Um, yeah, I think that zines have been an incredibly uh, effective tool, um, both for the design justice network um, and circulating our ideas. And I think that you know we were really inspired by you know other zine making work like that of Dan and Nasara. Um, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. Um, you know, I think the value of a zine is that it's a um, it's a it's a small booklet that you can produce yourself. A lot of people can get their hands into it, uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for participation in the design of them. Um, they can be printed, and that has a lot of value because um, it's still useful to get your hands on print materials 
and that allows um, people to engage with ideas in a way that um, things on a screen um, alone um, don't necessarily do. They, uh, there are things that people like to take with them and read while they're traveling. Um, there are things that work regardless of the context of technology access. Um, so you can use them in places where um, you don't have good internet access um, or where people don't all have access to you know, computers or mobile phones or internet connectivity. Um, you can use them when the power goes out. Um, you can use them when the, the whole system crashes um, for, for whatever reason it's crashing. Um, and so yeah, I think they, they have value as an object that people can make together um, and, as, and as something that feels a little bit more permanent than something like a post. It just kind of disappears in the, in the scroll um, without having to spend a, a huge amount of time, energy, and resources on like printing and distribution as you would with a more traditional sort of book or glossier you know, magazine format. Um, and we definitely we hear a lot that people use them as teaching tools um, in, in their classes in different contexts. And we are producing a number of new zines right now. Um, the one that's coming up next is the um, How to Organize a Local Node of the Design Justice Network zine, um, which is currently in production and uh, will be out this summer. Um, as well as we are translating the, um, the Design Justice Mediterranean zine that they already made um, into English, because currently it's in, um, I think it's only in Spanish and Catalan and Maybe it's in Italian, too. Thank you so much. Okay, well, um, there will be opportunity to talk with Sasha during the book signing session, um, which is happening right next door. So I would like this as an opportunity to thank you again for being here with us today for a fantastic talk. And I really look forward to continuous conversations now during book signing and during workshop. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>